Welcome back, listener. The second part of our tribute to Dr. Jim Roberts is reading an article he published back in 2018 in Emergency Medicine News in his column In Focus. And it's titled, How to Be a Good EP. Um, you know, I think it applies just well to any or any sort of a emergency medicine clinician, though. So um, here it goes, How to Be a Good EP from EM News, June 2018. And again, all links will be in our show notes. The website is twoview.fireside.fm. That's the number two view.fireside.fm. You did it. You graduated from residency and became a real EP. Your first day of work looms, and at the top of the agenda are unknotting your stomach and minimizing your palpitations. Odds are in the next month or so, you'll make your first big mistake. See a condition you never heard of before, miss your first intubation in years in front of the medical students, and order a BMW pending spouse approval. It's time to consider the magnitude of your plight. A real patient's life is squarely in your hands, and you are alone in a real ED. It scared the hell out of me when I started it and still does. I don't want to sound like your father or get too maudlin, corny, or holier than thou, but bear with me. I've been around a while. Any philosophy is much easier said than done, and this is the quintessential example. A lot of the following is what I strive for, but I've all too often fallen short. I screw up about three times a week. I'm just better at hiding it than you are. That talent comes with experience. Even after 44 years in emergency medicine, I still struggle, struggle with the ideal and philosophical versus the real world which is rife with serious limitations of resources and time, disappointing colleagues, unbelievably ignorant policymakers, and the unavoidable stresses of treating the sick, injured, frustrated, downtrodden, non-compliant, <clears throat> drugged, drunk, demanding, and overtly hostile. Keep in mind, however, that the 19-year-old with PVCs and the 43-year-old with obvious musculoskeletal chest pain both truly think they're going to die. Few will ever believe the bizarre uh, milieu that we live in that is the ED. Most of society could not begin to fathom what you choose to do. Most ignore or disbelieve the unpleasantness and think it's a really cool job. Your significant other or parents will never understand your day-to-day -day life at the office. Why do you wear those scruffy scrubs? When will you get a real office like those other doctors? Your spouse will muse, and how hard can it really be chatting up loquacious nurses, schmoozing with all those two flirtatious medical students and ogling those much too attractive drug reps? The vomit on your shoes and the dried pus and blood on your scrub should send a powerful and obvious message, but go figure. Nothing is allowed to annoy or phase you. Not even an impossible bipolar crack addict, the child molester with AIDS, hellacious maggot-filled bed sores, an acutely paralyzed teenager, or sudden infant death. You'll be expected to be cool, calm, collected, compassionate, caring, and erudite, a sympathetic and interested listener to even the most annoying tales, a quintessential politician, and a role model at the same time. You are often called upon to perform medical interventions far above your comfort level and way above your level of training. Newsflash. There is no training to equip you totally for this job. If you are not scared or befuddled at least once a shift, you're not paying enough attention. You're the anointed team leader, and you're always expected to portray a positive attitude and professional demeanor and to set the tone for the entire staff. Any negative attitudes toward the hospital, paramedics, administrators, house staff, or especially the patients are quickly transmitted to and adopted by everyone. You are often treating the disadvantaged, poor, helpless, hopeless, and hapless in a war zone-like atmosphere. If you want a quiet ED with all the bells and whistles and a respectful, polite, sweet-smelling, cash-paying clientele, you pick the wrong hospital and probably the wrong profession. Should have been a plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills like your mother wanted. The system is imperfect, very imperfect. It always has been and always will be. You will never have enough time, resources, personnel, equipment, or backup to make this job an easy one. Deal with that reality. If you want to thank you or even a lunch break, 
go sell shoes at Nordstrom's. What size? Which credit card? Now that's a cake job. On a good day, you have a cold pizza job. Above all, always, always, always be nice. Parents and family remember rarely what you said, but they always remember how you made them feel. There is only one time to make that first impression, a great opportunity to brand yourself as a hero and an angel of mercy. Be nice to the cleaning lady, security guard, cafeteria worker, and x-ray tech. Learn their names. They know yours. Talk effusively to your patients. Talk to them again. And always, always, always talk to the family. Look at them in the eye, not into the computer records. Sit down whenever possible. It says you are truly giving them a personal time and attention that you would want. That 280-pound demented nursing home patient with bed sores and a feeding tube is somebody's mother, and maybe she was the best third-grade teacher Philadelphia ever had. Many patients need a lesson in manners, and many colleagues need ones in compassion and basic common sense. Do not argue with patients over non-issues such as a few Percocet, an x-ray, a blood test, or even admission to the hospital if it's a close call. Resist the temptation always to be right. You won't be. Take the high road. Emergency physicians respond to a higher calling anyways. Don't publicly criticize another physician or hospital. You will develop a firm grasp of hindsight, but you are in a fishbowl every day and often talked about by name at surgery M&M conference. You may not know them, but the house staff knows you and you develop a lasting impression after their first encounter. Let that overpaid prima Madonna surgeon look like a jerk to all those who witness his barrage against you. A hardworking clinician making difficult real-time decisions on the job at 4 a.m. on Christmas Day, hoping to get home in time to see his kids come down the stairs. Huber should be skewed at all times. You're simply not that good, that smart, or that accomplished to be inflexible or pious with a colleague or a patient. Arrogance gets you into trouble more than incompetence. As Clint Eastwood would say, a man's got to know his limitations. Residents, nurse practitioners, and medical students can be fragile and insecure. You can give them confidence in their ability and career choice or shatter their self-esteem with a single thoughtless encounter. House staff may seem totally in control on the outside, but they're often scared stiff. It's a fine art to learn how to critique without criticizing, to instruct without insulting, and to evaluate without emasculating. Teach them how to be a better doctor than you are. Students are expected to surpass their teachers. And if they do not, maybe you are not such a good teacher. There's no shame in calling a consultant for a medical problem, a situation that is going poorly, or if you're in over your head. If your patient wasn't happy with your first plan or diagnosis, maybe it was flawed. So reconsider. Calling a consultant is a good way to share the liability. A family can accept that a loved one will die. But when the time comes, it is a harsh reality, even if they are in hospice. The children will always remember their father's last ED encounter. Make that time as painless as possible for all concerned. Someday you will face that reality yourself, as a patient or with a relative. You can't change much at the end of life, but you can listen and usually do something to console them. A bed in hospice is waiting for many of us. Be especially nice to old people. You will be one in a heartbeat. Trust me. That old guy from the nursing home can't remember what that 12-inch scar on his abdomen was from, but he might remember the jungles of Vietnam. Be nice to the homeless. These patients don't need your attitude or comments about their lifestyles superimposed on their illnesses. Get them a meal tray and don't discharge them at 3 a.m. That sickle cell patient, alcoholic, or heroin addict would like to be drug-free if a better life were in it for them. Most physicians shy away from the mentally ill and it's difficult to be their relative or doctor. Usually they can't find a good friend, let alone a good physician. That's why they were always in the ED. They actually like you. Nobody wants to be psychotic. Just be thankful that your serotonin and dopamine levels are under the bell-shaped curve most of the time. If you won't help this segment of society, who will? Few even try. If AIDS, mental illness, teenage pregnancy, or drug and alcohol addiction 
have not courted you or a member of your family, you are truly blessed. And dementia is likely the result of aging for most of us. When things are the darkest, remember what Mel Herbert told you. What you do really does matter. Medicine is a proud and noble profession, but it is actually just another service industry. Get used to hearing, when are you going to wait on me? I find patient rudeness, belligerence, and most importantly, entitled attitude the hardest to ignore. Get over it, or it will drive you nuts. Being a doctor can be viewed as a privileged or an entitlement. Choose the former. You are well compensated for your time. No one gets paid what he is worth. And although you're not an NFL player, you do okay in the grand scheme of things and are usually spared the repeated concussions and bad knees. Please don't whine or complain. Nobody likes a high-maintenance employee, especially a highly paid professional, who should be innovative and self-sufficient. If you can find a better job, don't tell me about it or bargain with it. Just take it. But remember, that greener grass always requires more fertilizer and weeding. The schedule is sacred. Don't miss a shift for two inches of snow. Show up on time. You know who you are. Here's a novel idea. Be that doctor who shows up 10 minutes early. Emergency medicine is not just a job. It's a lifestyle. But there is more to life than medicine. You can never make up a missed championship soccer game, anniversary, birthday, or chance to take your son or daughter fishing. In a heartbeat, your children will be on their own and will likely have trouble finding time for you. Remember that you might need a shift off someday, so be ready to help a colleague with a similar request. We have the medical world by the tail, set schedule, no beepers, no calls for orders, no insurance forms to fill out, and no bills to collect. We get paid even when the hospital does not collect a cent. You don't have to fill the nursing schedule or even find a replacement for your vacation time. You clearly work hard for your paycheck, but any general practitioner or pediatrician would take your job and salary in a nanosecond until they work their first ED shift. Next time you think you are underpaid and overworked, consider the GP who works 70 hours a week, gets calls with lab results at 7.30 in the evening, and eh, makes, makes less than you do. And never discuss your salary with the hospitalist. If you plan to give extra medical testimony, start a side business, or speak for a drug company, watch out for common pitfalls we all make. I have never turned down a chance to earn an honest buck, but it's a very seductive world out there, and your reputation can sink like a stone. Malpractice litigation is a slimy business. If you can get one rid of one bad doctor or get compensation for someone injured by indifference or incompetence, go for it. But it rarely works out like you planned. Don't sell your soul with absurd opinions to a doctor-hating jury. If you testify for money, and there is so much of it to be readily made, your colleagues will recognize what you have become. Finally, be careful with alcohol and your ready access to Vicodin and Percocet. Addiction can ruin a lot of lives, and it's easy to succumb. Many of those idealistic, halcyon thoughts of being a doctor, coupled with the blissful insouciance you've had as a medical student, will sadly never, ever materialize. Hopefully, this will help you endure a bad shift, embrace your profession, and avoid many of the same mistakes I have made over the years. Perhaps not. Maybe selling shoes at Nordstrom isn't such a bad idea after all. I can I can see faces of patients that I think of just hearing, like just reading these words and like there are certain people in hard times that like I see their faces and I hear the things they've said to me. Um, and uh, I can think of one guy right now in particular and um Multiple times as the ED, um, he would come in and he has like legit organic medical issues, but he also has like mental, like behavioral health issues as well. Um, and neither of them are well controlled, but he would always come back with, you know, this, this complaint multiple times a shift. And one time I was just like, you know, you, we've done this already twice. Like, why do you keep coming back? If you're, you're telling me, I just ask you, so the chest pain, shortness of breath, the same as uh, every time you come in. So why'd you come back? And he looks at me and he goes, well, I talked to you and I feel better. 
that I did it just stopped being my tracks and I was like <laughs> that's what I said to you last Saturday Mike why are you calling like, me again because just when I like, talk to you I feel better <laughs> it just cut me to the heart and um you know that guy as as whatever he has going on with him um that maybe was the clearest thing that he verbalized that maybe nobody else, none of other patients who are hard cases can verbalize to us that uh, I talk to you and if we're both on our games, um, I feel better. And um, if we can't offer our patients anything beyond that, at least we can do that for them, I suppose. Yeah. So, um, Jim's career was very vast and certainly there were so many other wonderful, wonderful pieces that he wrote. Those were two of my favorites. I'm really glad that a lot of you could sit and listen to those with us. And as I mentioned, we will be having that memorial service October 2nd at the ASAP meeting. If you'd like to come and say hello, would love to see any and all of you, especially people that work directly with Jim over the years. And I think that's enough for this episode, Mike. I think Jim would say, you've already gone on too long. <laughs> Remember these links, uh, these episodes can, or the, the, the articles can be found at our website. Again, twoview.fireside.fm. Let's talk our two view trivia question. Lots of great entries to this one here, um, but only one winner. Here is last month's question and answer. University Medical Center of Southern Nevada is the first hospital in the Las Vegas area. What was the first name of UMC and when was it open? The answer is UMC's first name was Clark County Indigent Hospital and it opened in 1931. Lots of right answers this time, but the winner who wrote and said, please tell me I won, <laughs> Julio Perez, you won, okay? Congratulations to you, Julio. <laughs> Check your email about how to claim your prize, okay? That's pretty great. I'm glad when people get that excited. All right, our trivia question for the episode that we have today has to do with some exciting news about our upcoming upcoming conference in Key West. As some of you know, Jim and I went to, have been going to Key West for 30 years fishing. I think um, finally, after working so hard uh, in my job, I was like, you know what? I'm taking a month off. And Jim and I took a whole month down there last year, and we had the best time. But we do have our course, our CCME course, our abstracts course, November 28th to December 2nd. It's the emergency medicine and acute care course. Um, this is a real hidden gem of a course, a fantastic course. It's completely redone every single year. Um, perhaps one of my favorites and the, I think a lot of fun. We dig into um, a lot of the recent literature and the faculty that go there answer clinically relevant questions from emergency medicine to urgent care practice. They look at studies, papers, great review manual. You can take back with you just the good stuff. And everyone wants to come to Key West. I know there's some storms down there in Florida, but I called my friend this morning and said, how's it looking? And she said, everything was good down in the Keys. Now, Fort Myers, different story, but Key West is doing okay. So the hotel rooms, they... They're almost all booked up, okay? And there are 15 additional discounted rooms that we were just able to get our hands on. They're going fast. So remember, November 28th to December 2nd, you know the deal. You'll have to request off for your shift. You know, talk to your scheduler. Go to www.ccme.org to sign up for this amazing course at the best location. Yeah, as we record this, uh, Key West, uh, the rest of Florida are just kind of recovering from Hurricane Ian, so our hearts go out to you if you or a loved one are in Florida. Good luck. Stay safe. Here is our trivia question. Key West is known for being the home of a famous American author in the 1930s who owned special animals, and the descendants of those animals still live on the property to this day. Who is the author, and what is special about these animals? Email us your two-part answer to our two-view trivia question or, you know, any feedback or comments from this or any episode to twoviewcast at gmail.com. That's the number twoviewcast at gmail.com. Also, in December, it's our final session of the original emergency medicine boot camp this year, December 13th through the 16th in Las Vegas for the main course, the pre-course workshops. Um, they're 11th through 12th for pharmacology, ultrasound and procedures treat yourself 
treat your patients and have a nice Christmas gift with us in Las Vegas. I will be there, Mike. I will. I will be there too. I can't wait. More information on the original and adverse emergency medicine boot camps, the emergency medicine and acute care course, or any of our courses are available at the Center for Medical Education website. That's www.ccme.org. Again, it's www.ccme.org. Thank you for listening to this really special episode of the two of you. I hope that you, however long or short your career in emergency medicine has been, were able to kind of look back a little bit and um, and think about how special how special we have it as emergency clinicians and maybe even look forward a little bit too to see um, kind of what to do now. How shall now we live, you know, as the saying goes. I totally bungled that, but you get the idea. Anyways, you can subscribe and rate us on Apple iTunes Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. Just put a rating in there, okay? Make it five stars. If you can't go as a five-star review, like just email us and tell us why, what you want us to do better here. Search for Two View Emergency on your podcatchers. That's the number Two View Emergency, and it'll come right up. Ratings help us climb the charts so that other clinicians get some Two View goodness like you are today. If you like YouTube and want to see the video blog instead, search for Center for Medical Education, and you can catch the video version. Don't forget our website where you can go next level on any of our topics from any of our episodes, including all the papers and sites we refer to. That's toview.firesaw.fm. Our audio and video engineers are Ricky Bucata and Dave Pett. Show notes are by Meg Dipple. Thank you again for tuning in, friends and EM. Share this podcast with a friend, share your thoughts via email, and thanks for sharing your time with us here at The Two View. Have a good day and have a great shift.